Hello Silicon Pioneers, it's time to connect the dots in the semiconductor universe. Thank you for joining us once more. I am your host, Semi Sherpa, your nerdy navigator through the galaxy of transistors, conductors, and capacitors, where electrons dance and energize our lives. Charge up, for Ohm is where the heart is. In our EUV lithography series, we have journeyed through the annals of EUV development and discussed the advancements in EUV light source power. We've unpacked the fundamental distinctions between deep UV and EUV lithography, highlighting differences in light sources, mirrors, and photomasks. Today's installment plunges into the captivating realm of EUV lithography, zooming in on the critical role of the EUV mirror. In our second episode, we delved into the sophisticated technology used to amplify the power of EUV light sources. Building on this, today's exploration will take us inside the EUV vessel to examine the EUV collector mirror and its tin contamination control measures. We'll then turn our attention to the illumination and projection optics developed by Carl Zeiss. Rest assured, our discussion steers clear of any confidential data from Carl Zeiss or ASML. Our mission is to synthesize publicly shared insights from these industry leaders, offering you a detailed understanding of the progress within this sector. We promise to bypass the headache-inducing equations and instead, provide an in-depth look at the mirror technology used in high-volume manufacturing tools. Did you know Carl Zeiss has produced a concise YouTube video showcasing their technology? We'll use a similar format but delve deeper, enhancing your grasp of Zeiss's cutting-edge work. So, gear up for a knowledge-rich voyage into the world of EUV mirrors. Ready to explore? Let's get rolling. This is our 21st video, so please give us some encouragement and support. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and turn on notifications. Yip yip. Arf arf. EUV light, which stands for extreme ultraviolet light is known for being heavily absorbed by a wide array of substances, including gases. This characteristic is crucial when considering its interactions with different materials. For example, left graph illustrates the penetration depth of EUV light in a substance, a term referring to how deeply the light can penetrate before its intensity is reduced to approximately 37% of its initial value, or mathematically speaking, to 1 over E of its original intensity. When examining the specifics of EUV light with a wavelength of 13.5 nanometers, we find that its ability to penetrate materials is quite limited, often not exceeding a few millimeters. In the realm of EUV and X-ray wavelengths, the Center for X-ray Optics, located at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, stands out as a significant resource. This center has compiled a comprehensive database detailing the optical properties relevant to these specific wavelengths. Delving into the application of EUV light, particularly in the field of EUV lithography, we encounter its pervasive influence. Materials tend to absorb light at wavelengths shorter than 40 nanometers quite significantly. The absorption phenomenon is primarily an atomic interaction, which means it is fundamentally dependent on the elemental makeup of the materials and less so on their complex chemical structures. Given the intense absorption and the uniform optical characteristics shared by materials at EUV wavelengths, engineers and scientists face limitations in crafting components that can effectively manipulate and direct EUV light. A telling example is the material calcium fluoride, which is highly transparent and argon fluoride laser wavelength of 193 nanometers, allowing 98% of light to pass through. However, at the EUV wavelength of 13.5 nanometers, its transmission rate plummets to nearly zero. This leads us to a significant conclusion in the context of EUV optics, there are currently no materials transparent enough to construct lenses suitable for EUV applications. This limitation is particularly pronounced when we consider the typical millimeter scale thickness of lenses in conventional optics, which would render EUV transmission effectively zero. Such constraints have profound implications for the design of EUV lithography exposure tools. They rule out the use of traditional refractive or catadioptric optics in these systems and extend to other optical components such as filters, polarizers, and various elements within illumination systems. This illustrates the broader impact of EUV light's absorption properties on the development of lithography technology and underscores the need for continued innovation in this field. 
Continuing with the intricacies of EUV light, we encounter a unique challenge, the strong absorption properties of EUV light. Essentially, this type of light is heavily absorbed by virtually all known materials. This includes not just solids but gases as well. This absorption is so significant that there are no materials available that can effectively transmit EUV light, therefore, the methods that we might use for optical imaging in other contexts do not apply here. Given this constraint, the optical imaging systems that work with EUV light must rely entirely on reflective techniques rather than transmission. In practical terms, this means that an all-reflective optical system is employed, encompassing everything from the illumination optics to the mask, all the way to the imaging optics. Such systems are a departure from those that employ lenses in their illumination and projection optics or use transmissive masks. Instead, all components that would traditionally be transmissive must be replaced with reflective alternatives. Delving deeper into the mechanics of these systems, we find additional complexities. The ability of homogeneous materials to reflect EUV light is minimal, particularly at the angles of incidence that are pertinent to high-resolution imaging optics. This is well illustrated by figures that examine reflectivities at these critical angles. Under normal circumstances, where wavelengths are less than 50 nanometers, every material has a refractive index that hovers around 1, much like that of a vacuum or air. By employing the Fresnel equation, which is used to calculate how light reflects off surfaces at normal incidence, we find that a single element material has very low reflectivity, typically around 1%. This makes achieving high reflectance from a single interface a formidable task, with the exception being at grazing angles of incidence, which are not typically utilized in high-resolution optics. A further complication arises even when considering compound materials. These don't exhibit significantly different optical properties under EUV wavelengths. The reason for this lies in the nature of EUV photons, which are high energy and interact primarily with the inner electron shells of atoms. Consequently, the optical properties in the EUV spectrum are dictated by the atomic structure rather than the particular chemical bonds present in the material. This uniformity in how materials behave optically under EUV light further limits the choices available for constructing reflective components in EUV lithography systems. As we delve deeper into the world of EUV lithography, we encounter two distinct types of mirrors specifically designed to work with the unique properties of EUV radiation particularly at the 13.5 nanometers wavelength essential for cutting-edge lithography processes. The first type is the grazing incidence mirror, which operates on the principle of total external reflection. These mirrors are crafted to capitalize on the behavior of EUV light at very shallow angles, termed grazing angles. When EUV photons strike a surface below a certain critical angle, they are reflected rather than absorbed. This angle is quite small, necessitating precision-engineered mirrors that can handle such shallow incidence of light. The efficiency of reflection for these grazing incidence mirrors is governed by the optical constants of their coating materials. These constants can be predicted by summing the optical characteristics of each element in the coating proportionate to their atomic densities. In practice, this means that grazing incidence mirrors are best composed of elements like molybdenum, ruthenium, and other good reflecting species that maximize reflectance while minimizing the presence of any contaminant atoms that could degrade the reflection. For instance, the reflectivities of thin films from these select materials, at the 13.5 nanometers EUV wavelength, are demonstrated in graphical data on the left, showing how they vary with the angle of incidence. Some materials maintain efficient reflection at angles as broad as 15 to 25 degrees. These mirrors are a crucial component in the space between the illumination optics and the photomask and high-volume manufacturing tools, illustrating their pivotal role in the EUV lithography process. The second type of mirror is the multi-layer mirror. This kind is engineered to function at near-normal angles of incidence and can achieve moderate reflectivity between 60 and 70 percent, which is a substantial figure for EUV wavelengths. These mirrors consist of alternating layers of materials with high and low atomic numbers, exploiting the slight difference in refractive indices at each interface to boost reflection. When a light wave encounters the transition between two materials with different refractive indices, some of the light is reflected. The more significant this difference, the greater the reflectivity. 
A stack of many such layers can cumulatively achieve a notable level of reflectivity, especially if the layers are structured to satisfy the Bragg condition. This condition ensures that light reflected from each layer interferes constructively with light from other layers, amplifying the overall reflection. According to Bragg's law, constructive interference occurs when the layer's thickness and the angle of incidence align with the wavelength of the light in such a way that the light waves from each layer are in phase, reinforcing one another. For EUV light, this means that the period of the layers needs to be half of the 13.5 nanometers wavelength for normal incidence. Nevertheless, these sophisticated optical components do face challenges. Grazing incidence mirrors can suffer reflectivity loss due to roughness and contamination induced by the sputtering process used in their production. Normal incidence mirrors, on the other hand, have to contend with additional factors like erosion alongside roughness and contamination, which can all contribute to the degradation of reflectivity over time. In the advanced field of EUV lithography, the challenge of finding the most effective materials for the construction of Bragg reflectors is pivotal. The task involves selecting materials that demonstrate relatively low absorption rates for EUV light. This characteristic is critical because in a multi-layer stack designed to reflect EUV light, each layer must allow the light to penetrate to sufficient depth, ensuring that subsequent layers can contribute to the total reflective effect. As one delves deeper into this subject, it becomes evident that material selection is a nuanced balancing act between optical properties and practical considerations. Initially, the scientific community involved in the development of EUV lithography grappled with the decision of which wavelength to utilize for optimal lithographic performance. Through collaborative efforts, spanning institutions such as the Institute of Physics on Microstructure in Russia and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in conjunction with Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory and the Foundation for Fundamental Research on Matter in the USA and the Netherlands, respectively, it was determined that multilayer stacks composed of molybdenum and silicon yielded the highest reflectivity at the crucial 13.5 nanometers wavelength. Despite shorter wavelengths offering theoretical benefits such as improved resolution, which is highly desirable in lithography, researchers often had to balance these advantages against the risks posed by the materials involved. Molybdenum and beryllium multilayers, for instance, showed promise at the 10 nanometers mark. Nevertheless, beryllium's toxic nature cast a shadow on its use, redirecting the focus toward molybdenum and silicon, MOSI, multilayers, which became the cornerstone of most EUV lithography research today. The precision with which these MOSI multilayers are constructed is of the essence. Molybdenum layers are typically 3 nanometers thick, while the silicon layers are approximately 4 nanometers thick. The performance of these layers is highly dependent on the angle of incident light. Thus, achieving a consistent reflectance across the operational wavelength requires graded depositions tailored for the optics. These reflectors are crafted into a stack of 50 by layers, their efficiency slightly tempered by the intrinsic absorption of the materials. In practical applications, sustaining high levels of reflectivity over extended periods poses a significant challenge. Studies indicate that when subjected to heat, the layers of polycrystalline molybdenum and amorphous silicon tend to merge, especially at the layer interfaces. This intermixing is particularly pronounced at the molybdenum on silicon boundary, as compared to the silicon on molybdenum counterpart. Moreover, wavelength dependent reflectivity calculations demonstrate greater accuracy when they incorporate the effects of the MOSI intermixing layer, which is corroborated by the graphical data. Nonetheless, there is a viable remedy, incorporating ultra-thin carbon or boron carbide, B4C, layers at the interfaces can effectively inhibit diffusion, substantially mitigating the intermixing phenomenon. This innovative approach is evident in the fact that while most C multilayers begin to intermix around 150 degrees Celsius, introducing MO2C or B4C barrier extends the thermal stability of these films to temperatures nearing 600 degrees Celsius. A B4C layer's inclusion can ensure reflectivity remains around the 70% mark, even at the pivotal 13.5 nanometers wavelength. However, the concern for peak reflectivity also encompasses its stability under high temperatures, as shifts in peak reflectance wavelengths can occur. To preempt this, films are annealed before use, aligning the peak reflectance with the operational wavelength. Yet, these efforts are constrained by the thermal instability inherent to the materials. For EUV masks, which are critical to the lithography process, 
elevated temperatures limit the deposition and etching processes to those compatible with low temperatures unless interface engineered multi layers are employed. This limitation underscores the need for methods that can endure the necessary conditions without degrading the mask's functionality. Moreover, the vulnerability of the multi layers to environmental factors such as oxidation necessitates additional protective measures. A solution found is the application of thin ruthenium capping layers, which shield the underlying structure from oxidation and preserve the reflectivity of the multi-layer system. Starting with the basics, lithography is a critical process in the fabrication of microchips, where patterns are transferred onto a substrate to create the intricate circuits of a semiconductor device. Deep ultraviolet DUV lithography utilizing krypton fluoride, KRF, or argon fluoride, ARF, lasers, has been the industry standard. This technology relies heavily on refractive lenses, which bend light rays to focus the image, and only incorporates a minimal number of reflective lenses. One of the main challenges with using refractive optics is chromatic aberration, a phenomenon where different wavelengths of light do not converge at the same point after passing through a lens, leading to a blurred or defocused image. To mitigate this issue, deep UV lithography uses a bandwidth narrowing module, ensuring that the laser emits light within a very narrow range of wavelengths. However, reflective optics, which are central to EUV lithography, do not suffer from chromatic aberration as they inherently possess a polychromatic response, meaning they can handle a broad range of wavelengths. Reflective systems follow the law of reflection, which dictates that light reflecting off a surface exits at the same angle at which it arrives, known as the angle of incidence. Unlike refractive systems, this principle holds true regardless of the wavelength of the incoming light. Bragg mirrors, the cornerstone of EUV lithography, are quite unique. These mirrors are composed of multiple layers, each with a different refractive index, which are designed to enhance the reflection of certain wavelengths based on the principle of constructive interference. At a specific angle of incidence, these mirrors are most efficient at reflecting what's called the Bragg wavelength, which is inherently tied to the spacing between the mirror's layers. Now, when it comes to EUV lithography, which uses Bragg mirrors, things get interesting. EUV light, typically generated from tin plasma, has a relatively wide bandwidth inherently. But as this light reflects within the Bragg mirror, the mirror narrows down the bandwidth to match the Bragg wavelength. This is a sort of natural filtering process where only the desired wavelengths are efficiently reflected, thus enhancing the EUV beam's monochromaticity. Contrary to the assumption that precision lithography necessitates an exceedingly narrow bandwidth, EUV lithography functions effectively with a bandwidth specification of approximately 2%, a notably more relaxed requirement compared to that of deep UV lithography. The reflectance from a single multi-layer mirror has a bandwidth of about half a nanometer, which is approximately 3.7%. In the operational realm of EUV lithography, when the cumulative effect of say, 10 reflections is synthesized to approximate total wafer transmission, the utilized spectrum narrows to a mere 1.8% of the plasma emission, which suffices to sensitize the photoresist. Thus, the EUV power is specified over a 2% bandwidth centered around the pivotal 13.5 nanometers wavelength. The reflective coatings on EUV mirrors are meticulously calibrated to this central wavelength to enhance EUV light reflection with a full width at half maximum, FWHM, of the reflectivity profile typically exceeding 0.48 nanometers. However, discrepancies in the spectral profile of these coatings can precipitate significant power inefficiencies, leading to a potential 10% loss of precious EUV energy, underscoring the importance of spectral precision in UV lithographic systems. To wrap up, the beauty of using Bragg mirrors in EUV lithography lies in their ability to self-filter the light, narrowing down the bandwidth through constructive interference. In the field of EUV lithography, a significant phenomenon to be aware of is out-of-band, or OOB, radiation. This term refers to unwanted light emissions that occur outside the narrow wavelength spectrum designated for chip patterning. EUV lithography utilizes light to create intricate patterns on semiconductor wafers, but not all the light emitted by EUV sources is beneficial for this process. EUV sources generate a spectrum of light that spans from soft X-rays to the deep ultraviolet section of the electromagnetic spectrum. However, 
The multi-layer optical systems and EUV lithography tools are designed to work with only a small part of this spectrum. The light that falls outside of this desired spectrum is what we call OOB radiation, which includes visible light, infrared, and vacuum UV light. These forms of radiation are considered detrimental to the lithography process because they do not contribute to the accurate patterning required and can lead to inefficiencies and errors. A significant part of the energy used to generate EUV light instead produces OOB radiation, alongside other byproducts like debris and heat, due to the low conversion efficiency of the light source. This is particularly true for laser-produced plasma, LPP, sources commonly used in EUV lithography. Interestingly, the mirrors designed for EUV lithography, which are made of layers of molybdenum and silicon, have the capability to select a narrow spectral band of EUV light, ideally centered around 13.5 nanometers. Despite this, they also reflect other wavelengths, including deep UV and visible light. This is because the EUV light source emits a multitude of wavelengths, and the reflective optics can potentially focus all of these wavelengths onto the resist, which is the light-sensitive material used for patterning. Among the various types of OOB radiation, infrared and deep UV light pose particular concerns. Infrared light can heat the wafer upon which chips are patterned, causing overlay errors. The heat absorbed by coatings and substrates can also raise the temperature of the optical components, particularly the illuminator. To mitigate the infrared OOB effects, both EUV vessels of ASML and Gigaphoton have integrated solutions like diffraction gratings on the collector mirror and filters to manage this type of radiation. With deep UV light, the issues arise from its ability to cause low resolution exposure on resists, which are chemical coatings developed to react to light and create the semiconductor patterns. The resists, based on chemical platforms similar to those used in older lithography methods, can be unintentionally exposed by deep UV light. Notably, wavelengths of 248 and 193 nanometers are problematic, with estimates suggesting that 4% of the light from an EUV exposure tool might be this unwanted OOB radiation. Resists have varying degrees of sensitivity to these OOB wavelengths, which cannot be ignored as they can negatively affect the imaging process. Unlike the desired EUV wavelengths, deep UV and other OOB wavelengths will blur the image if the resist is sensitive to them. This means that the actual effect of OOB radiation on the lithography process is also contingent on how reactive the resist is to these wavelengths. To address these challenges, tools like spectral purity filters, which include thin membranes, multi-layer mirrors, and specialized gratings, are employed. These filters work to prevent OOB radiation from reaching the illumination optics. Moreover, by repeatedly reflecting light through the multi-layer mirrors, the light spectrum from the EUV source is further refined, reducing the OOB radiation that gets through. Manufacturers of EUV lithography tools implement a variety of filters and design optimizations to minimize the amount of OOB radiation that can interfere with the patterning process. Still, it's not possible to eliminate all OOB radiation. To further control this radiation, users of EUV technology can apply special coatings on top of the photoresist. These top coatings can act as filters, although they add complexity to the process. Another strategy is to use resists specifically engineered to be insensitive to OOB radiation, thus preventing the unwanted effects without the need for additional coating layers. The core concept of the LPP EUV collector is the generation and collection of EUV light through plasma. This plasma is produced when a laser strikes a target material, creating a burst of EUV light. One of the main advantages of LPP sources is their isolated plasma nature. This isolation allows for open access to the EUV emission pattern over a full 4 pi steradians, SR. A steradian is a unit of measure for solid angles in three-dimensional space, analogous to radians for angles in a two-dimensional plane. However, a significant challenge with this technology is that not all the EUV light produced can be collected and focused due to intrinsic inefficiency in the collection process. Typically, LPP collectors can gather EUV light from the plasma over a solid angle of about 5.5 SR, which is approximately 88% of a hemisphere's solid angle. Nevertheless, this is a substantial amount when compared to other technologies like discharge-produced plasma, DPP, 
collectors, as the LPP collectors can collect roughly twice as much EUV light, thanks to a normal incidence design that can cover up to a 5.5 SR solid angle. The collector mirror's design is of particular importance. An elliptical shape is advantageous because it can focus the EUV light efficiently. With this configuration, the plasma acts as a light source at the primary focus, generating EUV light. This light is then collected by the ellipsoidal mirror, which reflects and focuses it onto the intermediate focus or IF. The light is then directed towards the illuminator optics of the exposure tool used to print the microcircuit patterns onto photoresist. By convention, the output power of EUV light sources is measured by the in-band power at the collector mirror's focus known as the intermediate focus which serves as a point light source for EUV imaging in the scanner part of the lithography equipment. Reflectance is a crucial aspect of the collector's functionality, with the collector mirror needing to maintain high reflectance across its entire surface. However, as the angle of incidence becomes less steep towards the edges of the collector mirror, the reflectivity for p-polarized light diminishes, leading to reduced intensity of the reflected EUV light in those regions. Uniform wavelength matching across the collection area is essential to ensure effective reflection of EUV light at the specific wavelength of 13.5 nanometers, irrespective of the location of light impact on the surface. The manufacturing and structural integrity of the LPP EUV collector involves several key processes. The infrared light used in the process heats the vacuum vessel area where the IR beam interacts with the tin droplets. This results in a substantial heat load of 40 to 100 kilowatts that needs to be managed. Therefore, silicon or silicon carbide is typically used for the substrate due to its high thermal conductivity and low thermal expansion properties. Additionally, cooling water channels are integrated within the structure to effectively manage the heat generated during operation. The process includes grading manufacturing to filter out infrared light from the CO2 laser, application of MOSI and CAP coatings to enhance reflectivity, and EUV reflectometry to measure the reflectance of the mirror. Once these steps are completed, the collector module is assembled and must pass module qualification to ensure it meets the required specifications. In the LPP EUV light source, the CO2 lasers operating at a wavelength of 10.6 microns provide the infrared radiation needed to generate EUV radiation. While these CO2 lasers are essential for the process, the infrared radiation they emit poses a challenge. It gets reflected by the collector mirror, just like the EUV radiation, and is then propagated to the wafer via subsequent mirrors. With a main pulse CO2 laser that has a power output of around 20 kilowatts, roughly 2 kilowatts of infrared radiation could be collected at the intermediate focus. This intensity of infrared radiation can heat the optics, reticles, and wafers, which might lead to severe optical distortion and a reduction in the accuracy of the semiconductor patterns being printed onto the photoresist. This heating issue is significant as the infrared radiation at the intermediate focus can be three to five times the intensity of the EUV radiation potentially leading to overlay errors that surpass the specification by up to eight times. Additionally, the heat could cause other problems like the mutual diffusion of multilayers and photon-assisted oxidation, which would reduce the lifespan of the optical components or even destroy them. To mitigate these risks, the intensity of the infrared radiation needs to be less than 10% of the EUV radiation at the wafer, which equates to it being 0.2% or less at the intermediate focus. One effective way to reduce the amount of infrared light reaching the wafer is by structuring diffraction gratings on the surface of the collector mirrors. The situation described assumes a grating pitch of 100 microns. To suppress the zeroth order beam of infrared light, thanks to the destructive interference, the grating can be designed with equal bar and groove widths, and a depth that is a quarter of the infrared light's wavelength, which is 2.65 microns. According to the grating equation, with the right grating design, the EUV radiation that is concentrated at the zeroth order will be reflected towards the intermediate focus for further propagation. In contrast, the infrared radiation will be diffracted to higher diffraction orders and blocked by the beam stop. The figures provided would illustrate the infrared out-of-band suppression design incorporating a built-in spectral purity filter or SPF system. In this design, the path of the EUV radiation is indicated by a blue line, and the path of the out-of-band radiation is indicated by a red line. With this system in place, the infrared light is effectively redirected away from the optical path towards the wafer, thus substantially reducing the amount of infrared radiation that reaches the wafers and preventing potential damage or loss of accuracy in the lithography process. The reflectance graph included in the slide demonstrates the effectiveness of the grating structure at around the 10.6 microns wavelength, indicating a significant reduction in IR reflectance due to the grating. The use of tin in the source vessel of LPP EUV lithography is a double-edged sword. 
kilograms of tin are introduced weekly into the source vessel as a target for the EUV generating laser. While tin ions are excellent for emitting EUV radiation, tin atoms unfortunately also have a high absorption rate for EUV light. This high absorption is problematic because even a nanometer thick layer of tin can lead to a significant drop in reflectivity of over 10%. The figures in the provided slides illustrate the severity of this issue. The image of a normal incidence graded multilayer coated collector shows the physical evidence of tin contamination and suggests that the collector's efficiency is drastically reduced by the presence of tin. The visual of pre pulse and main pulse droplets highlights the spread of tin droplets, indicating the substantial contamination that occurs during the EUV generation process. The graph shows the operation time of the source before the collector's reflectivity decreases by 10% as a function of droplet size. The assumption here is that all tin from the droplets hit by the laser spreads uniformly across the collector's surface. The lifetime of the collector is shown to be extremely short, where only a minuscule fraction, about one part in 100 million of the tin material impacted by the laser, can be allowed to accumulate on the collector's surface to maintain a minimum operational lifetime of one year. Additionally, it is crucial to prevent tin from building up on the optical surfaces and into the optical path. The image of a damaged collector after just 60 seconds of operation due to tin contamination underlines the rapid degradation and the urgent need for contamination control. The absorption strength of tin atoms for EUV radiation is depicted in another figure, showing the EUV absorption of a 10 nanometer tin layer across wavelengths near the EUV band, with data derived from the CXRO database. This graph illustrates how tin's high absorption at the EUV wavelength can impede the system's efficiency. Achieving a long collector lifetime is a significant challenge for EUV lithography, particularly for its adoption in high-volume manufacturing. The desired collector lifetime for continuous operation is approximately 4 months or 10 to the power of 7 seconds to minimize maintenance and maximize uptime. The environment inside the vacuum vessel, where high-energy ions and neutrals from the plasma can strike the collector surface, also needs to be considered. This can cause irreversible damage to the collector. Targets with uniform low-density tin that lack steep gradients not only optimize EUV generation but also reduce the kinetic energy of the ions. A smoother plasma density gradient results in a longer plasma scale length, lower electric field, and consequently reduced kinetic energy of ions, which aids in mitigating tin debris and extending the collector optics lifetime. Tin presents several challenges, primarily because it is a condensable fuel that deposits on surfaces within standard operating conditions of EUV tools. This deposition not only contaminates the optical surfaces but also degrades their reflectivity. High-energy tin ions or neutrals contribute to this contamination, making the surfaces rougher and causing erosion. Strategies for improvement include the use of gas transport systems, liquid and solid tin collection modules, surfaces that repel or attract tin, etching chemistry, and other methods. In the sophisticated arena of EUV lithography for high-volume manufacturing, ensuring the longevity of the collector is a prominent challenge. The source environment within the vacuum vessel is critical because high-energy ions and neutrals from the plasma can strike the collector surface, leading to irreversible damage. To mitigate this, a hydrogen gas barrier is employed as part of the debris mitigation technology. This barrier serves to protect the collector's multilayer coating from the detrimental effects of plasma ions, such as etching or implantation, which would otherwise lead to a swift decline in reflectivity, negatively affecting collector efficiency and power output in just minutes. The hydrogen buffer gas, introduced within the vacuum chamber, acts to slow these high-energy ions and is augmented by special capping layers to further shield the multi-layer reflective coating. Central to enhancing the collector's durability is the design and implementation of a hydrogen gas flow within the source vacuum chamber. Active intervention is required to preclude the accumulation of tin on the collector mirror, which would impair reflectance, and hydrogen gas flow is a key strategy in this preventative measure. The hydrogen serves to reduce tin contamination on the mirrors by two principal methods. The first is the physical flow of hydrogen molecules, which engage in collisions with tin atoms or clusters, effectively diverting them from the mirror. A vigorous flow of hydrogen from the central opening in the collector mirror towards the plasma establishes a barrier to the tin ions, preventing most from reaching the collector surface. This form of protection, known as piclet protection, is illustrated in the figures, demonstrating how hydrogen flow redirects the tin away from the mirror. The stopping power of the tin ions is dictated by the pressure of the hydrogen gas. The second method is chemical cleaning with hydrogen gas. Hydrogen reacts with tin to form stannin A, SNH4, through a chemical process. When hydrogen gas encounters the high-energy plasma, it dissociates into elemental hydrogen, 
creating hydrogen radicals capable of scavenging any tin that has made its way to the collector's surface. Hydrogen is not only superior in terms of thermal properties and stopping ions but also serves as an effective etchant for tin. This advantageous property allows the use of pure hydrogen, without additives, in the source for tin etching, described by the reaction tin solid plus 4H radicals yield SNH4 gas. The volatile nature of stannin A at room temperature means it can be readily removed from the source vessel. Furthermore, hydrogen radicals, produced by the dissociation of molecular hydrogen, are key to the self-cleaning mechanism of plasma. This dissociation is triggered by several mechanisms within the source, including dissociation in the plasma region, photodissociation by plasma radiation, and dissociation by photoelectrons. The overall tin cleaning process relies on two critical reactions, H2 plus EUV light yields 2H radicals, and SN plus 4H radicals yield SNH4 gas. Despite beneficial properties of hydrogen buffer gas, there exist challenges associated with the use of hydrogen. The low lifetime of hydrogen radicals and the instability of stannin A are noted as potential issues. Stannin A, while volatile and thus removable by vacuum systems, can decompose upon contact with metal surfaces, leading to the redeposition of tin within the source chamber. This deposition is problematic because the collector mirror, situated at the bottom of the source chamber, is at risk of being contaminated by tin droplets that could potentially drip down. This risk requires additional engineering solutions to manage tin deposition effectively, as low-pressure hydrogen flows can manage smaller tin particles but are less effective against larger droplets. In selecting a buffer gas for EUV sources, we must adhere to several stringent requirements. The gas must impede swift ions effectively while ensuring high transparency to EUV light, facilitate heat transport, and possess the capability to etch tin from the collector surface without incurring significant EUV absorption. Hydrogen stands out as a superior choice, fulfilling all these roles with efficiency. It cools the vicinity of the plasma, halts fast-moving tin ions, and removes tin from the collector. These tasks are achieved with an EUV absorption that does not exceed the tolerable limit of 20-30% to within the EUV power budget, a critical factor in maintaining the source's operational integrity. Moreover, the buffer gas should not only perform optimally but also be economically viable, considering the quantities needed for the operation of the source. When evaluating alternatives, hydrogen's high heat capacity and thermal conductivity are crucial for plasma cooling. The first figure in the image indicates the specific heat capacity of various buffer gases, showing hydrogen with a markedly higher specific heat capacity compared to alternatives like argon, helium, nitrogen, neon, xenon, and krypton. This property is advantageous for maintaining plasma temperature. The second figure demonstrates thermal conductivity among these gases, with hydrogen again outperforming the rest, indicating its superior capability in thermal management. The final crucial aspect is the gas's ability to stop fast ions, a function that any gas can perform at high enough densities. The real challenge is to identify a gas that combines this ability with reasonable EUV transmission. The third figure in the image presents the EUV transmission capabilities of a gas column measuring 1.5 meters in length. This length is indicative of the typical distance that EUV photons travel within the source vessel. The gas has a density that is sufficient to halt 5 kV tin ions over a distance of 10 cm. This data serves to emphasize hydrogen's outstanding performance in allowing EUV light to pass through while stopping fast ions. Hydrogen, being the lightest element, offers the least absorption of EUV radiation, making it highly advantageous. It has a significantly smaller absorption cross-section for EUV light compared to xenon, especially at the critical wavelength of 13.5 nanometers. For instance, EUV light at this wavelength can transmit through hydrogen gas at 10 tor with over 98% efficiency over a 1 cm path, whereas xenon at the same pressure allows less than 1% transmission. This efficiency is particularly noteworthy since operations at 10 tor, despite being below atmospheric pressure, are still practical for EUV sources and exposure tools, demonstrating hydrogen's exceptional suitability for these applications. Tin debris management within an EUV source is a complex process that involves the categorization and handling of debris generated from the plasma. This debris is classified into two main types, primary and secondary. Primary debris is the matter that originates directly from plasma, which has not yet collided with any surfaces or been captured by the gas flows within the source. The introduction of a buffer gas, specifically hydrogen, into the environment serves a critical role in mitigating the effects of this vapor phase debris. 
hydrogen gas collisions reduce the kinetic energy of fast-moving ions, effectively nullifying the potential harm these ions could cause to the collector surface. While primary debris does not directly contribute to the degradation of the collector's reflectivity, it does impact the overall effectiveness of debris mitigation. It heats the gas and decreases its density in the region between the plasma and the collector surface, which can be counteracted by a continuous influx of fresh, cold hydrogen gas at high flow rates into the vessel. The buffer gas is not only responsible for stopping fast tin ions produced during the laser target interaction but also for cooling the region near the plasma and absorbing the momentum and heat from the plasma. Furthermore, the counterflow of the buffer gas provides a barrier against tin diffusion toward the collector, thus protecting it. A significant objective in managing tin debris is to engineer gas flow patterns within the EUV source that capture tin vapor and transport it out of the vessel before it can settle on any internal surfaces or hardware. While it's nearly impossible to prevent vaporized tin from depositing inside the vessel entirely, the deposition can be substantially reduced by optimizing the gas flow to minimize the gas's residence time within the vessel. This approach leads to an increased flow of the buffer gas, which, while cooling the plasma, also minimizes tin deposition. The likelihood of tin vapor adhering to a solid surface is quite high, resulting in some tin vapor being deposited on the walls before it can be pumped out. Once the tin vapor is out of the main vessel volume and the optical path, it is crucial to separate this vapor from the rest of the hydrogen exhaust to prevent clogging the gas pump lines. To protect the scanner volume from debris, hydrogen is also used as a buffer gas. Protection from contamination is enhanced by employing a gas curtain, which involves flowing gas at low pressure to carry contaminants away from the optics. This method, referred to as the dynamic gas lock, DGL, by ASML, helps minimize gas phase diffusion from the source to the scanner by directing a flow of buffer gas through the opening from the scanner towards the source. While this dynamic gas lock can suppress gas phase diffusion effectively, fast or large microparticles may still penetrate it. These can be blocked by a small obscuration bar placed in the direct line of sight from the plasma to the intermediate focus, IF, which is the logical interface between the source and the scanner. Since the IF aperture is typically small, the obscuration does not significantly block EUV light, allowing almost all primary debris to be prevented from entering the scanner volume. Care must also be taken with micro droplets that could reach the IF aperture after bouncing off vessel walls and other internal hardware. This is usually minimized by designing geometrical shapes that eliminate the direct path particles might take toward the IF, requiring them to undergo multiple bounces, thus exponentially reducing their movement after each bounce. Secondary debris encompasses all particles that have collided with a surface within the EUV source, like the vessel walls. This category includes tin microparticles that scatter and return to the collector surface. Accumulation of tin within the vessel is also considered secondary debris. Over time, this accumulated tin can protrude into the paths of EUV or CO2 optics, interfere with the vacuum exhaust path, and alter gas flows. However, the source geometry and the collector's upward-facing position necessitate a wall directly above the collector, complicating tin management. Gravity can cause the collected tin, which is facing upwards, to fall or drip onto the collector surface. The presence of hydrogen radicals can cause small tin droplets to be ejected into the gas above the molten tin surface, posing a significant challenge as they are difficult to control with gas flow and may require large amounts of gas to manage. When tin accumulates in liquid form due to the heat from the plasma, it becomes susceptible to the ejection of liquid tin material under the influence of hydrogen radicals. These radicals diffuse through the liquid tin, recombine into hydrogen gas, and form bubbles. These bubbles rise to the surface of the liquid tin and burst, creating small droplets, typically up to 50 micrometers in diameter but potentially as large as 1 millimeter. These droplets, propelled by various forces including gravity, gas flow, or their initial momentum, can land on the collector surface. Thus, molten tin should be allowed to accumulate in the vessel only for a limited time. Managing secondary debris involves implementing design features within the vessel to minimize backscattering of micro droplets, which could otherwise lead to tin deposition on the collector surface. Micro droplets of tin, due to their speed and trajectory, are largely unaffected by the gas flow and tend to follow a straight path, often depositing on the walls rather than the collector surface due to their initial velocity vectors pointing away from it. The use of veins within the vessel, which come in various types and geometries, is one such strategy. These veins are designed to trap tin particles through multiple bounces, reducing the likelihood of them reaching critical components. Stanton A, SNH4, formation offers a route for debris removal as it becomes a gas under the conditions within the source and can be evacuated via pumping. 
Nevertheless, this process competes with the photodissociation of stanine and its catalytic dissociation on tin-covered surfaces, both of which can lead to the redeposition of tin on the collector surfaces, thereby hindering the cleaning process. The ultimate aim of debris mitigation is to minimize the residence time of stanine within the vessel and to reduce its wall collisions. By achieving this, the redeposition of tin due to the dissociation of stanine is significantly reduced, thereby enhancing the cleanliness and performance of the EUV source. Maintaining cold surfaces within the vessel leads to tin accumulating in a fluffy, low-density form, which should be avoided as it quickly occupies significant volume, obstructing gas flows and pumping paths, and can protrude into the EUV optical path. In contrast, tin deposition on hot surfaces results in the formation of dense tin, which occupies the minimum volume possible and, being above its melting point, can be directed to flow into a dedicated collection location. An essential aspect of tin mitigation is the effective removal of tin from the vessel. Ideally, more than 95% of tin should be extracted to prevent its accumulation and interference with the EUV or CO2 optical paths. Tin removal processes are categorized as either online or offline relative to EUV production, with online removal being preferable as it doesn't interrupt source operation. ASML addresses the challenge of tin accumulation inside the vessel by ensuring all tin is removed from the system into external drains and buckets. This involves heating vanes like thermal cycling above the melting temperature of tin and controlling the temperature precisely so that tin can flow on the vein. The lower cone is consistently heated by the diffracted infrared light from the collector's grating structure, ensuring the upper cap inside remains clean. The lifespan of collector mirrors in EUV lithography is a significant concern due to the intense conditions within the source module. These mirrors, layered with molybdenum and silicon, are outfitted with an additional protective coating. However, this necessary protection initially lowers the mirror's reflectance to about 45%. Over time, the reflectance typically decreases, mainly because of tin deposition on the mirror surface. There are instances where the thinning of the protective layer might cause slight increases in reflectance. The deterioration of reflectance is quantified as a percentage change for every billion pulses of EUV light, a measure known as percent per gigapulses. Advancements in technology have reduced the collector mirror degradation rates to below 0.1% per gigapulse of EUV light. This decline means that for every 5.6 million hours of operation at a 5 kHz laser pulse, the reflectivity drops by 0.1%. The extension of the collector's service life has been achieved through several innovations, including the application of a silicon nitride capping layer, the use of a grating collector design, the introduction of a zirconium nitride capping layer, integrated cooling systems, tin scrubbers, heated veins, coatings that prevent blistering, tin scrubbers with extended lifetimes, oxidation-resistant caps, split perimeter flow, and heated tin scrubbers. Recent updates have shown an even more impressive decrease in degradation rate to 0.016% per gigapulses when operating at 250 watts, as reported by ASML. This benchmark rate of degradation suggests that the total change in mirror reflectance will be less than 20% relative to its initial value after one terapulse of operation at power levels exceeding 250 watts. The effectiveness of debris mitigation techniques, as implemented in the ASML Simmer source, has led to longer operational lifetimes in the field, with some of the best performing NXE, 3400C collectors showing functionality up to 1 tera pulse, as depicted in the accompanying figures. A hydrogen radical based tin cleaning technique has been devised to increase the rate at which tin is removed from the collector. This method involves delivering hydrogen radicals to the collector's surface when the source is offline. The effectiveness of this technique is illustrated in figures that show the condition of a used NXE, 3100 collector both before and after treatment with hydrogen radicals. Initially, the collector is significantly covered with tin, but after the treatment, it appears clean with the tin removed. As the power of the source increases, the protective measures for the collector must also evolve to prolong the life of EUV collectors. The enhancements made to the collector protection system have resulted in longer lifetimes for the actual light source systems. Additionally, the choice of material for the capping layer is critical in preventing tin deposition. A comparison of different capping layer materials from Gigafotin's tests reveals significant variations in performance. Material experienced blistering, Material B showed no blistering but had a thick layer of tin deposition, and Material C demonstrated excellent resistance to tin deposition, highlighting the importance of material selection in extending the collector's lifespan. Gigafotin, a Japanese company specializing in EUV source technology, has developed an innovative approach to managing the issue of tin debris called magnetic debris mitigation.
This method aims to reduce the flow of tin particles toward the collector mirror, which is a critical component in EUV systems. The concept utilizes a strong magnetic field to capture ionized tin particles, which are effectively ionized through double pulse irradiation, and then directs them into a specifically designed tin trap. These confined tin ions are subsequently discharged from exhaust ports, thereby minimizing their potential to cause damage to the collector. For this magnetic confinement to be effective, a significantly high magnetic field, exceeding 1 Tesla, is necessary. Such intense magnetic fields typically require the use of superconducting magnets. The way this works is that the magnetic field deflects the moving charge tin ions and clusters, known as debris, through a phenomenon called Larmor precession. This magnetic deflection does not impact photons and neutral tin debris, which are unaffected by magnetic fields. However, the success of this technique also depends on maintaining a reduced background gas pressure within the system. If the pressure is too high, collisions between tin ions and gas molecules may occur, which would significantly reduce the effectiveness of the magnetic field in trapping the tin ions. Gigafoton reports that this method of magnetic mitigation is highly efficient, achieving more than a 98% reduction in the number of tin ions that reach the collector. This is a significant improvement and shows the potential for magnetic mitigation to offer a promising alternative to existing debris mitigation methods. It has demonstrated an encouraging mirror degradation rate of only minus 0.6% per gigapulse. Illustrations provided by the company at bottom right show a plot of debris deposition on the collector using this magnetic mitigation approach. The data reveals that the tin flux is relatively small across most of the collector's surface. However, there are two specific locations where the tin deposition rate spikes to approximately 2 nanometers per million pulses. These areas are near the locations of the traps, indicating a significantly high flux that could lead to a rapid loss of EUV reflectivity if not managed properly. Despite this challenge, the overall effectiveness of magnetic debris mitigation suggests it could serve as either an alternative or a supplementary technique to the baseline method of using hydrogen gas for debris mitigation in EUV lithography systems. The collector mirror is a crucial component that poses considerable challenges in terms of serviceability due to its size, cost, and susceptibility to damage from intense radiation. Given its proximity to this radiation, when damage occurs, it can be quite severe. To replace a collector mirror, the vacuum vessel must be vented, leading to a halt in production. This necessary venting process, along with the subsequent pump down, translates directly into lost productivity. Consequently, regular maintenance is essential not only for swapping the damaged collector mirror with a new one but also for recycling the old mirror. To enhance serviceability and reduce downtime, ASML has innovated with the introduction of modular vessel integration in the NXC 3400C scanner. This modular design is instrumental in supporting quicker service actions, particularly for the collector mirror swap. It significantly improves maintenance efficiency, reducing the time required for collector mirror service by sixfold, from a protracted 50 hours to a mere 8 hours. Furthermore, it speeds up the replacement of the droplet generator by three times. These enhancements have led to an exemplary availability rate for the NXC 3400C source, which now exceeds 90%. Comparing the previous and new systems, the former GWE system incorporated a stainless steel vessel equipped with features such as flow vanes, cooled vanes, a heated scrubber, and a heated drain pipe. In contrast, the new modular vessel system adopts a cold flow concept which eliminates the presence of liquid tin within the vessel. This system uses a modular aluminum vessel, which is complemented by shorter vanes, an extended heated scrubber, and a tin catch with a capacity that's designed to last a year. These innovations represent a significant step forward in the serviceability of EUV lithography equipment, ensuring less downtime, more efficient maintenance, and ultimately, greater productivity for users. The EUV Scanner's Illuminator module is a sophisticated system designed for precise control and distribution of light. The setup starts with an EUV radiation source, which is strategically placed in a separate module from the illumination system. This source module creates a secondary radiation source at an intermediate focus within the scanner's entrance plane. This scanner comprises three primary sections, illumination optics, projection optics, and the wafer and mask stages. Its configuration, particularly the illumination and projection optics for a 0.33 Na EUV exposure system, resembles optical exposure tools but with a key difference, all optical elements in this scanner are reflective. 
This design is a strategic choice to boost overall optical transmission, leading to a concentrated effort to reduce the number of optical elements, thus optimizing efficiency. The light's journey begins at the intermediate focus, where the collector reflects EUV light. From there, it travels through the illuminator optics, which consist of two normal incidence mirrors, FFM and PFM, and one grazing incidence mirror, GM. These mirrors are crucial in directing the light accurately towards the mask. However, simply using the intermediate focus to illuminate the reticle doesn't yield the desired performance. Instead, the light enters the illuminator at this point and undergoes transformation to achieve a high-quality light distribution at the reticle. The illuminator is engineered to excel in three key areas, ensuring uniform illumination across the object field, shaping the light distribution in the pupil, and efficient transmission. It's designed to provide exceptionally homogeneous illumination of the mask, coming from precisely defined irradiation angles. Inside the NXC 3400 Systems Illuminator Module, known as Illumo, are several mirror modules. Each of these mirrors is strategically placed in predefined positions to define the path of the illumination beam from the intermediate focus to the photomask. Specifically, the Illumo houses three types of mirror modules, the Field Facet Mirror, FFM, the Pupil Facet Mirror, PFM, and the Grazing Incidence Mirror, GM. The illuminator optics further manipulate the light, adjusting its spatial and angular distributions based on the principle akin to a fly's eye. This is achieved using the object facet mirror, composed of many small mirrors, which breaks the incoming light into numerous smaller images. These images are then uniformly projected over the field of view by the pupil facet mirror, also made up of many small mirrors. Each small mirror and the object facet mirror can be individually rotated, allowing for precise control over the light's intensity and angular distribution. This level of control is essential for the precise requirements in EUV scanning processes. In the realm of EUV scanners, the concept of a reflective fly as integrator is a pivotal component. This concept, drawn from the well-established principles of cooler illumination in illumination system design, is adeptly adapted for EUV illumination systems. The basic idea is to optimize illumination to achieve uniform ring field fill and uniform pupil fill, essential for precise and accurate light manipulation. Full-field systems, specifically for printing patterns with EUV, favor cooler type illumination. This preference is due to the nature of plasma sources used in these systems, while intensity fluctuations of the plasma source might alter the light distribution in the pupil plane, they do not affect the uniformity at the mask level. The distribution of light in the pupil plane is crucial for the imaging behavior, but it's generally less sensitive than the uniformity at the mask. The prime advantage of this design approach is achieving exceptional uniformity in the reticle or field plane. Like in optical exposure tools, the illumination optics in EUV scanners serve two main functions. The first is to ensure that illumination is uniformly applied across the exposure slit. The second function is to enable the shaping of the illumination for resolution enhancement and source mask optimization. These objectives are met using two sets of mirror arrays. The light from each field facet mirror is projected across the illumination slit, resulting in a uniform light distribution, akin to what a fly's eye array accomplishes in an optical exposure tool. The fly's eye integrator comprises two mirrors, each made up of reflecting facets. The first mirror, positioned in a plane conjugate to a field plane of the projection optics in the cooler illumination system, consists of field facet mirrors, FFM. This mirror reflects EUV light from the intermediate focus, IF, which acts as a point light source in the scanner. Positioned at a calculated distance from the IF, this mirror creates an extended illuminated region known as the far field of the source. The design of the field facets, ideally shaped to the required object field like a curved slit, maximizes efficiency. Each facet of this first mirror images the IF onto a facet of the second mirror. The FFM has around 330 facet mirrors and 10 actuator units, allowing for the adjustment of mirror angles to direct reflected light to specific facets of the second mirror. The second mirror, aligned in a plane conjugate to the pupil plane of the projection optics in the cooler system, consists of pupil facet mirrors, PFM. Each facet of this second mirror, along with a condenser mirror, images the corresponding facet of the first mirror onto the mask. 
Additionally, the condenser mirror projects the facets of the second mirror into the entrance pupil of the projection optics. The PFM plays a crucial role in mixing light to ensure intensity homogenization over the slit. A grazing mirror is used to create a curved slit beam, which is preferred over a straight beam due to its lower aberrations, reduced mirror size, and steeper reflection angle, leading to higher reflections. The superposition of hundreds of field facets at the mask results in outstanding uniformity of the illumination field. In the Starleth 3100 illuminator, for example, a uniformity of plus or minus 1% is achieved. Notably, the light distribution at the mask is independent of spatial fluctuations within the plasma. An important aspect of maintenance and monitoring involves the radon system, which displays the collector light image. Radon works by descrambling the pupil image in different slit positions, allowing for the monitoring of collector mirror contamination. This feature is critical for maintaining the efficiency and accuracy of the EUV scanner's illumination system. The evolution of illumination systems in optical exposure tools has been significant over the past decades, leading to advanced capabilities in inverse lithography technology, ILT, also known as Source Mask Optimization, SMO. This advancement has resulted in highly flexible, programmable illumination systems that can finally adjust the illumination shape, thanks to the availability of thousands of mirrors. This level of control allows the actual illumination shapes to very closely approximate the ideal ones. In the context of EUV scanners, the illuminator module, referred to as ILUMO, plays a crucial role. The illumination system must allow for flexible adjustment of the pupil shape affecting angular light distribution to optimize the aerial image. Two key elements in designing an EUV illuminator are the field facet module and the pupil facet mirror. Taking the NXE 3400B scanner as an example, which uses a cooler type design, the illumination system allows for changes in the illumination setting without efficiency loss. This is achieved through a flexible flies eye integration system. The system features a programmable field facet mirror array where the mirrors can be tilted to project light from the intermediate focus, IF, to a pupil facet mirror, based on the desired illumination pattern. The versatility of this system is evident in its ability to form different illumination shapes, such as vertical and horizontal dipoles. The process involves reprogramming the field facets, as depicted in left figures. The illuminator, named Flex Pupil, directs light from the IF to different pupil locations by superposing light from individual field facet mirrors. Since each mirror can have its own orientation and tilt angle, the array can fill the pupil with complex arrangements of light spots. The Flex Pupil Illuminator supports various advanced optical aperture illumination OAI, settings required for higher resolution imaging, including annular, dipole, and quadruple pupil fills. While programmable illumination is also a feature of EUV exposure systems, these systems have significantly fewer mirrors compared to optical exposure tools. The mirrors in EUV systems, both field facet and pupil facet mirrors, are necessarily shaped optical elements, and their surfaces must be of very high quality. This requirement substantially increases the cost of manufacturing such arrays for EUV lithography systems. As a result, EUV systems typically have fewer mirrors, leading to coarser adjustments in illumination. This necessitates modeling lithographic performance and calculating optical proximity corrections based on actual, rather than ideal, illumination shapes to ensure accuracy. Tuning the illuminator pupil is a powerful tool for image optimization. SMO, recently extended to EUV, has further enhanced imaging capabilities, including discrete pupils. Customized settings like freeform pupils are available, alongside standard settings. Pupil fill ratio or PFR measures how much light fills the pupil area. Generally, it is advantageous for an illuminator to permit a low PFR. A small PFR allows more aggressive OAI, improving the imaging resolution. Additionally, it provides increased flexibility to improve contrast and thus expand the process window through SMO. With less pupil area needed to be filled with light, there is more freedom to choose how to distribute the light. For instance, a small PFR of 20% significantly improves performance, as demonstrated the figures on the right. Achieving a PFR smaller than 40% involves switching off certain field facets, resulting in light loss. 
However, in the highly flexible illuminator of the NXC 3400B, a PFR of 20% can be achieved without light loss. Attaining a PFR below 20% poses challenges due to stochastic effect with a 0.33 numerical aperture system. Traditional deep UV lithography systems like KRF and ARF reduction scanners employ dioptric lenses which allow for a rectangular slit shape. This configuration is advantageous as it utilizes the center of the lens where aberrations are minimal, thus maintaining the rectangular shape of the slit through the scanning process. However, when we shift to catadioptric lenses, the slit still retains its rectangular shape, but its height is reduced, and it may be offset from the center. This adjustment is necessary due to the central obscuration inherent in catadioptric systems, a phenomenon observable in the top left figure provided. In such systems, the field that is being imaged comes from a larger circular area akin to that in a scanner lens, ensuring that the image quality remains uniformly high across the entire field. Diverging from the straight slit of an optical scanner, EUV lithography systems opt for a ring field instead because it aligns better with the aspherical mirrors used in the system. Aspherical mirrors are crucial for focusing EUV light accurately due to their ability to correct for optical aberrations more effectively than spherical mirrors. The ring field's curved shape matches the aspherical mirror's contour, allowing for precise control of aberrations across the entire image field. This design avoids the need for enlarging the mirrors, which would be necessary with a straight field to achieve similar levels of aberration correction. Thus, the ring field enables compact and efficient design while ensuring high-quality imaging. Another main reason for adopting a curved slit is that it is sourced from a ring field which ideally provides the best imaging at an infinitesimally small ring width. Imaging performance deteriorates at positions inside or outside of this optimal ring width, worsening progressively with the distance from it. The adoption of a curved slit in EUV systems simplifies the optical design, reducing the number of elements required to correct for aberrations and thereby minimizing reflections to maximize throughput, a key consideration in EUV lithography. In optical lithography, the standardized shape for the field to be imaged onto the wafer after scanning is a rectangle measuring 26 mm by 33 mm. The magnification setting, known as MAG, is fixed at 4x, translating to an object field size of 104 mm by 132 mm. This configuration is specifically chosen to fit the object field onto a 6-inch mask. During the scanning process, a full-width slit of 26 mm on the wafer but significantly shortened in the perpendicular direction is imaged by the projection optics. These specifications, initially established for deep UV lithography, have been carried over to EUV for compatibility reasons. However, a curved slit necessitates a greater travel distance for scanning start and end points compared to a straight slit. In essence, the curved slit field employed in EUV systems offers several advantages. The radial symmetry is inherently more robust to aberrations compared to a straight slit. The use of smaller projection optic box, or POB mirrors, results in more efficient mirror usage. Additionally, a steeper angle of incidence, more akin to 90 degrees, facilitates better mirror reflection. Let's delve into the intricate journey of EUV light within the ASML NXC 3400 HVM tool, from its genesis to its interaction with the photoresist on the wafer. The story begins in the source vessel where tin droplets are heated by a high-power CO2 laser until they become a plasma state, a process that generates EUV light. This light is then captured by a collector mirror designed with a 5.5 steradian collection angle and directed towards the intermediate focus, or IF, which serves as a point light source for the scanner segment of the apparatus. Within the scanner's illuminator module, a trio of mirrors, namely the field facet mirror, the pupil facet mirror, and the grazing incidence mirror, work in concert to deliver a uniformly illuminated curved slit while shaping the beam. To refine the beam's uniformity across the slit, the Unicom module, equipped with around 30 adjustable fingers, precisely manipulates the field intensity distribution. The beam's journey continues through a pellicle before reaching the photomask, which is a complex component composed of a tantalum-based absorber atop a MOC mirror. This mask is held in place on the reticle stage by electrostatic force, a method necessitated by the incompatibility of previous vacuum chucking techniques with the hydrogen vacuum environment of EUV scanners. 
The patterned light, now bearing the information from the mask, reflects back through the pellicle and enters the projection optics box, or POP. Here, the EUV light is intricately directed through six reflective mirrors, each one contributing to the process of achieving a 4x reduction imaging with a numerical aperture of 0.33. This reduction is crucial as it allows for the precise scaling of the image to the wafer. To maintain the correct image scale, the reticle stage moves four times faster than the wafer stage during the slit beam scan. A notable change in the CUV system is the wafer stage itself, which, like the reticle stage, has transitioned from vacuum to electrostatic chucking. The alignment system, too, has evolved from an encoder-based to an interferometer-based system, an upgrade likely spurred by the need for precision in the hydrogen vacuum environment and the prohibitive cost of encoders. Historically, the path to refining EUV projection illumination systems has been paved with key lessons. Early research indicated that aspherical lenses are indispensable for managing aberrations. The most straightforward designs that can print large fields were found to be scanning ring field architectures. These systems must maintain minimal image distortion, not just across the ring width in the radial direction, but also along the outer arc defined by the slit in the cross scan direction. To enable uniform exposure of multiple chips on the same wafer, an even number of mirrors is essential, and the system's design must incorporate an accessible stop. This stop ensures that diffraction orders from various mask features are either passed or blocked consistently, preventing non-uniform image structures. Further insights from design efforts in 1996 underlined that ring field designs minimize scan distortion and reduce the size requirements for mirror substrates. Optimal designs would likely incorporate at least six aspheric mirrors, with the two mirrors closest to the image possibly following the Schwarzschild design form. It was also recognized that keeping the numerical aperture at or below 0.5 simplifies the complexity of reflective imaging system designs considerably. Embarking on an exploration of the projection optics system in EUV scanners reveals a fascinating facet of modern lithography. Every EUV optical system relies on mirrors, a design choice dictated by the high absorption of EUV wavelengths by any bulk material. The designers of these sophisticated systems face a unique constraint, they must use the fewest mirrors possible. This limitation stems from the individual mirror's limited reflectivity, compelling a design that incorporates no more than six mirrors. Despite such a constraint, these systems, folded into a six-mirror configuration, achieve remarkable imaging performance. The wavefront errors within these optical systems are managed to an extraordinarily low level, a testament to the precision required in EUV lithography. The art of optics design demands versatility and freedom to balance the intricate dance of aberrations within the system. It is here that the preference for full aspheric designs becomes clear, these allow optics designers the latitude to fine-tune each mirror, ensuring that the final image projected onto the wafer is as close to perfect as possible. For numerical apertures ranging from 0.25 to 0.33, a six-mirror assembly is essential to correct the full field. This configuration is not just a theoretical exercise but a practical reality, as demonstrated by the Advanced Development Tool and the Starleth series from Zeiss Company, including the 3100 and the 3300 and 3400 families. The Starleth 3400 projection optics box stands out as a paragon of optical engineering. It features six meticulously crafted mirrors with a numerical aperture of 0.33. Two substrate structures ensure thermal stability through water cooling and maintain dynamic stability by decoupling. The chief ray angle at object side measures a negative 6 degrees, with a slit width of 26 mm at the wafer level, and achieves a 4 times magnification, bringing the minutiae of circuitry into sharp relief. Across the industry, various systems showcase six mirrors with similar geometries. A folded beam path characterizes these all-reflective EUV projection systems in off-axis geometry, an ingenious solution to avoid the mirrors obscuring each other. However, in the complex world of optics, reality often presents distinct residual aberrations across different orders. When combined with the effects of multilayer coatings, these aberrations prompt lithographic simulations that reveal performance differences, meriting further scrutiny. 
A promising aspect for EUVL technology is the existence of several optical systems capable of advancing the technology to the 30 nanometers device node and beyond, each based on their high optical performance, scalability, low incidence angles, reduced metrology risk, and adequate back working distance. Within this competitive landscape, three designs stand out. The PPNPNP configuration is a leading candidate, owing to its high level of aberration correction, low incidence angles, and minimal peak departure. Following closely is the NPNPNP design, notable for its exceptionally low coma and aspheric departures. The PNNPNP design also captures attention, with its superbly corrected residual wavefront error and minimal higher order aberrations across the field. Here, N signifies a convex or negative mirror, while P denotes a concave or positive mirror. Looking to the future, the next generation of EUV optics, the high NA EUV systems, emerge from the conceptual phase into active development. With a numerical aperture of around 0.55, they promise resolutions below 8 nanometers half pitch. These systems are larger, necessitating even more stringent specifications to achieve the desired performance. A critical factor in the design of EUV systems is the reflectivity of MOSI multilayers, which experimentally is about 70% at 13.4 nanometers. This reflectivity implies that the transmission of a 6-mirror system suffers a reduction of approximately 50% compared to a 4-mirror system. Such a significant loss has led to questions about the feasibility of a 6-mirror design. However, focusing solely on transmission is a flawed approach. Transmission alone does not capture the light gathering capacity of the system. A more accurate measure is the product of the illuminated area and the solid angle of the imaging cone, known as étendu or étendu in French. When multiplied by the transmittance, étendu becomes a gauge for the theoretical throughput of a projection system. Comparatively, a four-mirror system has a smaller ring field on the wafer and a lower numerical aperture, resulting in a smaller étendu and, therefore, a reduced capacity to handle light. On the other hand, the six-mirror system, boasting a larger ring field and a higher numerical aperture, possesses a significantly larger étendu. This increased étendu enables the system to process a greater volume of light, ultimately translating to higher throughput. Despite the inherent light loss due to the additional mirrors, the six-mirror design's capacity to utilize light more effectively gives it an edge, particularly when accommodating larger ring fields. In the complex and precise world of EUV mirror metrology, the quality of an optical mirror is determined by analyzing the surface roughness at various spatial frequencies. At the heart of this process is the power spectral density, or PSD, which is used to measure and specify surface errors of EUV mirrors. It allows us to understand how the surface roughness at different spatial frequencies impacts the optical performance of the mirrors. The analysis typically involves breaking down the surface roughness into three categories, LSFR or low spatial frequency roughness, which is also referred to as figure, MSFR or mid spatial frequency roughness, and HSFR or high spatial frequency roughness. The PSD graph provides a detailed representation of these roughness categories, with the x-axis representing spatial wavelength and the y-axis showing the PSD. The spatial wavelength along the x-axis denotes the distance over which a pattern repeats on the mirror's surface, while the PSD on the y-axis captures the intensity of surface height variations. This statistical measure correlates the surface variations in the z-direction with the spatial frequencies in the xy-plane. For the LSFR or figure, which concerns wavelengths greater than 1 mm, this describes the overall shape or curvature of the mirror's surface. The figure is associated with the contour or form the optical surface is designed to have, representing the largest scale errors. The most suitable technique for assessing figure errors on a full-size aspherical EUV mirror is interferometry, a method that offers the necessary precision. When it comes to MSFR, which spans wavelengths between 1 mm and 1 micron, this roughness scale influences the contrast and uniformity of the light projected by the optical system. MSFR is assessed using microinterferometers, which require careful removal of the aspheric shape, accurate calibration of systematic interferometer errors, and mitigation of vibrations to ensure a successful finishing process. The HSFR, ranging from 1 micron to 50 microns, describes the fine-scale roughness that can lead to increased surface scattering or light loss. 
High HSFR can degrade a mirror's reflectivity and transmission efficiency. Although HSFR does not directly affect imaging, it is responsible for light loss due to scattering from the mirror surface. Atomic force microscopy, or AFM, is typically employed to measure HSFR, with particular attention paid to potential artifacts from the scanning procedure and external vibrations. To achieve a comprehensive understanding of a mirror's surface quality, data from full aperture interferometers, microinterferometers, and AFM are all merged. This combination provides a continuous PSD that covers the complete relevant frequency range, ensuring there are no gaps in the data. The PSD is extremely useful for assessing surface topography tolerances, predicting system scattering behavior, analyzing fabrication processes in terms of spectral properties, detecting metrology artifacts, and refining data through spectral filtering and transformation. The classification of spatial frequencies into LSFR or figure, MSFR, and HSFR, and their respective associations with aberrations, flare, and transmission loss, serve as a general characterization of the mirror surface roughness and its impact on stray light. Understanding the spatial frequency requirements of EUV mirrors is key to grasping the intricacies of the projection optics and lithography systems. In the demanding field of EUV lithography, where every nanometer counts, the manufacturing of mirrors presents a formidable challenge, one that is central to the projection optics capacity to produce precise and accurate images on the wafer. Let's first consider the figure error. The optical performance and the fidelity of the final image are often gauged by the wavefront aberrations that the projection optics introduce, which are capable of causing overlay and critical dimension uniformity, or CDU, errors. The wavefront specifications become a pivotal aspect of the design process for projection optics. A satisfactory imaging performance in a UV lithography typically requires the system wavefront deviation to have an RMS value smaller than lambda divided by 50, which is significantly stricter than the well-known Maréchal criterion of lambda over 14 RMS for diffraction-limited imaging. This stipulation translates to a wavefront error in the EUV lens that must not exceed approximately 270 picometers RMS, meaning that the deviation of a single mirror in a six-mirror lens system must be smaller than roughly 55 picometers RMS. A specification that is 20 times tighter than that for 193 nanometers ARF lithography. This precision must be maintained within the optical footprint that corresponds to a single field point on the mirror. Consequently, while the full mirror specification may be somewhat relaxed, it typically remains below 100 picometers RMS. However, this tolerance must account for the cumulative effect of all potential deviation sources, including fabrication errors, gravity-induced bending, mounting effects, residual design deviations, coating effects, mirror heating, among others. Therefore, the fabrication tolerance is but a fraction of the total tolerance budget. Zeiss, a pioneer in optical technology, often visualizes this extremely challenging requirement in a tangible way. Imagine an EUV mirror with a diameter of 450 mm. If we were to inflate this mirror to the size of Germany, spanning 850 km, then an accuracy of 50 picometers and surface deviations would correspond to height variations of just 100 microns across the country. Inflated to the scale of the contiguous United States, the allowable roughness defects must not exceed 0.4 mm. Now let's turn our attention to MSFR and HSFR. The advance of optical lithography toward EUV has escalated demands on the roughness of optical surfaces. Early EUV lithography researchers recognized that surface roughness at very high spatial frequencies on lens mirrors would scatter light. Initially, this roughness was expected to scatter light only at wide angles, falling outside of the exit pupil of the projection optics. The primary effect of such roughness was seen as a reduction in the total light reaching the wafer, with little impact on imaging quality. However, wafer patterning using early tools revealed a significant degradation of image contrast, approximately 35%, due to high levels of scattered light, known as flare, which transferred to the wafer plane at levels much higher than previously observed in optical lithography. For mirror surfaces with deviations at LSFR, light will reflect specularly but potentially at incorrect angles, resulting in aberrations. When the roughness is on the scale of the wavelength of light, some of the reflected light scatters across a range of angles. 
At HSFR, the scattering angles are so large that the scattered light does not pass through the optic's exit pupil, resulting in an effective loss of light intensity. In the case of MSFR, light is still scattered but makes it to the wafer, though not necessarily where intended, degrading the quality of image formation. In optical systems, the term flare specifies stray light or light scattered in unintended directions. Small angle scattered light may propagate through the optical path to the wafer, contributing to image blur and contrast loss as flare. The imaging impact of flare is profound, with stray light reaching the wafer as flare reducing the image contrast and narrowing the process window in the lithographic imaging process. It particularly affects the critical dimension and the CD uniformity of the printed features. Reduced contrast leads to a heightened sensitivity of CD to dose errors, and flare introduces proximity effects that depend on the local mask transmission, reducing the overlap of process windows due to dose offsets. Initially, flare was perceived as the most critical performance specification for EUV optics, influencing CD and optical proximity correction, or OPC. The total integrated scatter, or TIS, resulting from reflection in a system with N mirrors, each having an equal RMS roughness sigma, is given by a specific equation at normal incidence. An EUV mirror surface induces a factor approximately 2,600 more stray light compared to an ARF lens element surface with the same roughness, underscoring the heightened impact of roughness error and the related flare problem in EUV systems. To keep TIS below 4%, which corresponds to 4% flare in the case of MSFR or 4% reflection loss for HSFR, the RMS roughness in the corresponding spatial frequency bands must fulfill a condition below 90 nanometers. Surfaces exhibiting such low roughness values, below 100 picometers RMS, are usually referred to as super-polished. To keep OPC efforts within reasonable limits, a flare level of less than 4% is necessary. This demands the MSFR to remain well below 100 picometers RMS. Surface scattering in the HSFR band reduces the intensity of the specular reflection, thereby reducing transmission and throughput. Therefore, HSFR also needs to be smaller than 100 picometers RMS to achieve the targeted system transmission. The journey of EUV projection optics is a tale of precision engineering and technological evolution. Since the late 1990s, Zeiss has been pioneering the development of EUV manufacturing technologies, drawing on two decades of experience in fabricating EUV and X-ray optics for applications in spaceborne astronomy and synchrotrons. The foray into EUV optics began with a round-robin test and mirror fabrication, initiated by Sandia National Laboratories, that Zeiss participated in with the production of ELT-2, a component of a three-mirror microstepper optics design. As we entered the early 2000s, the foundational fabrication and metrology technologies for EUV were developed within the framework of the two-mirror microexposure tool, or MET program. This initiative was funded by Semitech and executed in partnership with the EUV LLC, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Remarkably, even at this early stage, all fabrication and metrology processes were capable of handling off-axis geometries. The knowledge gained here laid the groundwork for the subsequent fabrication of the off-axis full-field alpha demo tool, or ADT, projection optics. Throughout the progression of the Zeiss Starleth 3100 and Starleth 33X0 programs, there was a consistent drive to improve and adapt processes with a focus on enhancing quality and productivity. Over the last 15 years, there has been a continuous reduction in figure errors as well as mid-spatial frequency roughness, or MSFR. These refinements have enabled a level of system resolution, overlay, and contrast that was unprecedented at the time and continues to improve. This evolution is captured in a figure where three distinct parts are delineated, each showcasing the development and milestones achieved. In the realm of commercial full-field optical systems, significant strides have been made. Early alpha, beta, or pre-production tools featured a numerical aperture, or NA, of 0.25. These were followed by production tools with a NA of 0.33, such as those from the Zeiss Starleth 3300 and 3400 family, now produced in significant numbers. The increase in NA has led to larger mirror diameters, with some reaching up to approximately half a meter. The heightened wavefront performance demands have necessitated the use of steep aspheres. 
The mirrors must be positioned with an accuracy that falls within less than a nanometer and a nanoradian, comparable to the precision needed to hit a 20-centimeter diameter target on the Moon from Earth. This precision is exemplified in the bottom left figure for Starleth 3400 projection optics. However, the fabrication and measurement of mechanical parts are conventionally on the order of micrometers, which is a thousand times larger than the accuracy needed for EUV optics. To bridge this gap, an adjustable mirror mounting technology has been developed. When combined with a structurally rigid setup, the required accuracy and stability are achieved. This level of precision is not only essential during the fabrication, mounting, and assembly processes in the lens and scanner factories but must also be maintained during the alignment and realignment processes on the wafer manufacturing floor, even within the vacuum conditions. For a highly productive EUV exposure tool to be feasible, mirrors with the highest reflectivity and minimal light loss are paramount. A right table illustrates the improvement of optical performance parameters across different product generations, from the early MET and ADT to the current Starleth series. Alongside product releases featuring a 0.33 NA, there have been strong technological advancements, resulting in imaging performance capabilities down to 13 nanometers half-pitch resolution. As with all optical lithography systems, the key optical performance parameters for EUV projection optics are categorized by aberrations, flare, and transmission. A bottom right figure demonstrates the reduction in wavefront RMS error from greater than 1 nanometer to about 0.2 nanometers. This reduction is primarily driven by figure errors and is evident in ASML EUV scanners post alignment. The system wavefront has seen a notable reduction in terms of figure quality, starting from less than 1.25 nm RMS in the ADT, improving to less than 0.75 nm RMS in the Starleth 3100, and achieving less than 0.25 nm RMS in the Starleth 3300, where 0.27 nm corresponds to lambda over 50. Each bar in the graph represents a shipped system, reflecting the tool generations. There has also been remarkable progress in MSFR and flare reduction. Each symbol in the graph represents a single mirror and all MSFR values, showing the significant advancements made in reducing flare. Early full-field exposure tools experienced approximately 40% long-range flare, with improvements bringing it down to 17%. At a NA of 0.25, MSFR of 0.14 nanometers was able to keep system flare at 10%. The next generation of full-field exposure tools achieved 7-10% flare, while today's tools exhibit long-range flare at approximately 3%. This contrasts sharply with state-of-the-art KRF and ARF lenses, where long-range flare of less than 1% is routine. This narrative of EUV projection optics evolution showcases the meticulous and relentless pursuit of precision and performance that has defined the field, marking a journey of continuous improvement that mirrors the relentless advancement of the semiconductor industry. Delving into the complexities of creating EUV mirrors, we enter a realm where the substrate material plays a critical role. In the manufacturing of these mirrors, maintaining an immaculate surface figure is as vital as selecting a substrate with an exceptionally low coefficient of thermal expansion, known as CT. This property is crucial for EUV lithography mirror substrates because, in EUV systems, about 70% of the incoming EUV light is reflected while approximately 30% is absorbed by the mirror material. This absorbed light is transformed into heat, leading to an inevitable temperature rise in the mirrors. Since EUV systems operate in a vacuum chamber, heat dissipation from the mirrors is significantly constrained. During the operational life of an EUV mirror, a temperature increase of a few degrees Kelvin is not unusual. For most materials, such a change in temperature would result in surface deformations far exceeding the stringent specifications required for EUV optics. The challenge, then, is to swiftly and uniformly remove the heat to maintain the sub-nanometer accuracy of the optical surfaces, especially as the projection optics need to preserve extreme figure tolerances at an atomic scale even under the thermal load induced by EUV light. To mitigate thermal effects and maintain consistent optical performance, all mirrors in the projection optics of EUV exposure tools are constructed from low thermal expansion material, or LTEM. There are primarily two classes of materials used for this purpose, glass ceramics, such as Zerodur or clear serum, and amorphous titanium dope-fused silica, like ULE. 
These materials are designed to have their CT approach zero at a predetermined temperature, known as the zero crossing temperature, ZCT, ensuring minimal thermal deformation when operating near this temperature. Mirrors functioning at or close to their ZCT experience negligible thermal distortion, maintaining the integrity of the optical system. To ensure the EUV system performs optimally under operational conditions, the ZCT value, the CT slope, and the spatial variation of the CT must be controlled to extremely tight tolerances. ULE, an ultralow expansion glass manufactured by Corning, has a CT that is virtually zero at a singular temperature, with non-zero values at temperatures above or below this point of zero expansion. This characteristic is quite distinct when compared to fused silica, which, with a CT of 0.5 parts per million per degree Celsius, is also considered a low expansion material but not as refined as ULE for the purposes of EUV optics. However, both L10 classes come with their own set of challenges. For example, in glass ceramics like Zerodur, certain fabrication processes that etch away at different rates can expose microcrystallites, inadvertently increasing the high spatial frequency roughness, or HSFR. Conversely, ULE mirror blanks may exhibit striae, which are vertical stratifications within the material that can affect the uniformity of material removal during the shaping of aspheric surfaces. These striae are known to contribute to the mid-spatial frequency roughness, or MSFR, particularly if the figuring and finishing processes are not meticulously controlled. The choice between these materials may also depend on the mirror's position within the EUV system. For instance, mirrors situated in different parts of the system might benefit from the specific properties of one material class over the other. Each optical element absorbs a portion of the EUV power heating up not only the element itself but also the chamber walls. Reflectivity, peaking within the usable bandwidth, drops sharply outside this range, with the non-reflected light adding to the thermal load and complicating the heat management further. This necessitates that each element be adequately cooled. Fortunately, the reverse sides of mirrors can be employed for cooling purposes. There is a higher heat concentration in the illuminator area, while the temperature control in the imaging optics area requires even more precision. The tolerances here are incredibly tight. With reflective optics, any surface error in the direction of the incident light impacts the imaging beam twice, which means that the usual requirement of 0.02 lambda for surface accuracy translates to an actual surface precision of 0.01 lambda or 0.014 nanometers. This level of precision is astonishing, approaching a fraction of the size of an atom. The process of fabricating and inspecting mirrors for EUV lithography is a testament to precision engineering. To achieve the target surface of a mirror, a highly sophisticated set of surface interferometry and polishing techniques is required. Given that less than 70% of the incident EUV light is reflected by each mirror, the addition of every pair of mirrors results in more than a halving of light intensity at the wafer. This necessitates the use of aspheric optical elements in EUV lithography. Small area polishing tools are essential for creating aspheric mirrors, and it is critical to ensure that the polishing process does not introduce roughness that corresponds to the size of the polishing tool itself. Furthermore, the multilayer deposition process, which involves layering materials to create the reflective surface, can actually have a smoothing effect on the substrate roughness. However, this must be carefully balanced with the goal of maximizing total reflectance. Given the strict requirements for the mirror surface figure, the deposited multilayer films must exert minimal stress to avoid deforming the precisely polished glass substrates. For mirrors with a numerical aperture, NA, of 0.33, this results in large mirrors, sometimes up to half a meter in diameter, with strongly aspheric surfaces that pose a significant challenge to polish while maintaining extremely high surface quality. The fabrication scheme for these mirrors begins with generating the basic shape of the mirror. Depending on the material, the desired geometry and surface shape are produced using precision diamond grinding or milling machines. The roughness reduction, or finishing, is then carried out by polishing with relatively large tools equipped with dedicated pads and slurries. Choosing the correct polishing slurries and pads is crucial for reaching the targeted roughness in the 100 picometer range. The figure is corrected by computer-controlled figuring technologies that shape the surface locally, based on error maps obtained from full aperture interferometers. 
Techniques such as computer-controlled polishing, CCP, ion beam figuring, IBF, or magnetoreological figuring, MRF, can be employed for this purpose. The challenge lies in controlling the surface quality across all frequency bands of LSFR, MSFR, and HSFR simultaneously. Local figuring can deteriorate the roughness, leading to issues such as residual tool tracks in the MSFR domain or etching effects in the HSFR domain. Conversely, finishing with large tools can degrade the aspheric figure due to the locally non-isotropic surface curvature. To achieve the very low MSFR and HSFR specifications, specialized super-polishing techniques have been developed. An iterative process that carefully balances finishing and correction steps is necessary to converge to a sufficiently smooth surface over the figure, ensuring that the MSFR and HSFR regimes meet all system requirements. This iterative procedure is required to eventually achieve a PSD that is sufficiently smooth and meets all system requirements. The accuracy of any precision fabrication is limited by the accuracy of the accompanying metrology. EUV metrology must cover the complete spatial frequency band from roughly 1 meter down to 10 nanometers with accuracy and precision at atomic scales, without leaving any gaps. Figure measurement is performed by full aperture interferometers, which are equipped with dedicated compensation optics to deal with the aspheric shape of the surfaces. The climate-controlled instruments used for this purpose must be capable of characterizing mirrors up to 500 mm in diameter, necessitating robotic loading due to the weight of the mirrors. These instruments provide two-dimensional surface topography maps, which inform the computer-controlled figuring process. They must handle meter-class optics and ensure repeatability significantly below 100 picometers to enable a converging figuring process at the 100 picometer scale. Intrinsic calibration errors of the interferometer, as well as mount or gravitationally induced deformations, can contribute to inaccuracies if the optics are not tested in their operational geometry and mounting hardware. Today, repeatability and reproducibility on the order of 10 to 20 picometers RMS are achieved in line production. The reflective surface of the mirror is a Bragg reflector film built up by coating up to 100 quasi-quarter wave layers of alternating materials, with molybdenum and silicon being the typical materials used for the 13.5 nanometer wavelength. These reflectors have a narrow spectral bandwidth and a theoretical maximum reflectivity of around 75%, with practical values closer to 70%. Consequently, after two mirror reflections, more than half the light is already lost. The coatings must not only preserve the mirror substrate's figure but must also be distributed over the curved surface to match the local angular light distribution, enduring full power production use for several years. In the past, electron beam evaporation, or EBE, was employed to coat mirrors for the ASML Alpha Demo Tool and the Zeiss Starleth 3100 systems. However, EBE has its drawbacks, such as the inability to use load locks for mounting substrates, which slows down the process and introduces potential instabilities during coating. Additionally, the semi-automated nature of the process, especially in situ monitoring, is labor-intensive. With advancements in magnetron sputtering technology, which offers greater process stability, Carl Zeiss transitioned to using magnetron sputtering, or MS, in a fully automated process. The machines developed for this process cater to the special needs of Carl Zeiss and can coat large substrates up to 680 mm in diameter with up to six different materials. Currently, the mirrors for the Zeiss Starleth 3300 and 3400 systems are coated using improved machines. The multilayer deposition must have minimal impact on the mirror figure. The polishing process achieves a figure within 100 picometers, and the coating process should not cause significant changes. The coating can alter the figure either due to multilayer induced substrate stress or due to lateral thickness errors. When depositing thin layers of different materials on top of each other, the variation in atomic distances and interatomic forces can create stress within the multilayer, leading to deformation of typical substrates by several tens of nanometers. While some deformation can be compensated for by aligning the mirror, the non-correctable residues can still be in the range of several hundred picometers, which is unacceptable. To reduce such deformation, the MOSI coating can be modified to have low stress values, either by altering the MO to C ratio or by adding an anti-stress layer underneath the multilayer with opposing stress values. 
Lateral layer thickness deviation from the designed value is another factor that can contribute to figure error. Considering a thickness error of 0.1%, a deviation of just 7 picometers per bilayer from the design value could accumulate to a figure change of 350 picometers for a multilayer with 50 bilayers. Compensating for long-range errors might be feasible through alignment, but short-range errors are more challenging. Hence, the precision required for the coding process must be in the very low picometer range per bilayer on average. When these stringent requirements are met, high reflectance of the multilayer is generally achieved directly. In practice, coding precision down to plus or minus 1 picometer per bilayer on a substrate radius of more than 225 mm has been accomplished. In the realm of EUV lithography, maintaining the pristine condition of optical surfaces is paramount. Contamination on these surfaces can increase roughness and deviate from stringent specifications, compromising the ultra-high smoothness and precision required for the optical elements. Oxidation of these surfaces poses an irreversible threat to the system's functionality, which is why the multilayer structure includes a capping layer specifically designed to prevent such oxidation. While carbon buildup, another form of contamination, is presumed to be cleanable, the procedures to remove it must be optimized. Cleaning cycles, as well as the time and frequency of cleaning, must be balanced to minimize disruption to production and the cost of ownership, with mirror lifetime specifications exceeding 30,000 hours, or approximately 3.5 years. Contamination has long been a concern across various lithography technologies, and EUV lithography is no exception. Unlike traditional optical scanners, EUV exposure tools operate under unique conditions. Exposures at EUV wavelengths must occur in a vacuum, as EUV light does not propagate in air. For instance, the transmission of 13.5 nanometer light through just 0.1 millimeter of air at atmospheric pressure is about 7%. To maintain the necessary conditions for EUV lithography, the vacuum environment must have exceptionally low levels of contaminating gases. Due to the much shorter wavelengths in EUV light, a significant number of secondary electrons are generated when the EUV radiation is absorbed. An EUV photon can either directly break a molecular bond or stimulate desorption, or it may do so indirectly through secondary electron emission from the mirror. These electrons can catalyze surface chemical reactions, which may lead to the oxidation of projection and illuminator mirror surfaces or to carbon deposition if the levels of water vapor and hydrocarbons within the vacuum environment are not meticulously managed. Early EUV exposure tools experience carbon contamination on optical components, which can significantly reduce lens transmission and thus productivity. For example, a carbon layer just 1 nanometer thick on every mirror in a 6-mirror lens system can degrade the lens's transmission by over 7%. This necessitates that all components within the vacuum chamber must be constructed from ultra-high vacuum-compatible materials and that exposure tools must have built-in capabilities to prevent optics contamination from resist outgassing. To prevent contamination of the optics, one approach is to create a flow of inert or reducing gas at a low partial pressure between the optics and the wafer. This method, illustrated in the left bottom figure, is known as a gas curtain or a dynamic gas lock or DGL. Outgassing material is swept along with the gas flow, thus reducing contamination. Despite a small amount of EUV light absorption by the gas, estimated to be less than 3% for an optimized flow, effective protection is achievable even at low gas pressures. If hydrogen gas is utilized for this gas curtain, it can remove deposited carbon by forming volatile gases. A dynamic gas lock is strategically placed at the interface between the wafer stage compartment and the projection optics box, POB. In this dynamic gas lock, a directed gas flow towards the wafer effectively reduces contamination from resist outgassing. This has been a feature of NXE scanners from the Alpha Demo tool to the present, successfully suppressing hydrocarbon species that may outgas from the resist during exposure, although it may be less efficient for heavy metal hydrides. The introduction of a DGL membrane now forms a physical barrier between the POB and the wafer stage, ensuring 100% suppression of outgassing species and complete protection of the POB. The inclusion of a membrane between the wafer and the optics expands the range of resist materials that can be used, marking a significant advancement in the field of EUV lithography and mirror fabrication and inspection. Farewell, Silicon Pioneers!
Today, we've navigated through a detailed exploration of EUV mirror technology, shedding light on the sophisticated art of manipulating EUV light with artificial Bragg reflectors. It is my hope that this episode has deepened your understanding of the cutting-edge advancements in EUV technology, as brought to us by industry leaders ASML and Zeiss. We've now journeyed through the development history, dissected light source power enhancements, delved into tin debris management, and scrutinized the collector mirror along with the illumination and projection optics integral to EUV lithography. As we draw this chapter to a close, the narrative of EUV photomasks and photoresist remains untold. Yet, I realize we've yet to explore these elements in the context of deep UV lithography. Thus, my aim is to illuminate these topics first before circling back to the remaining facets of EUV technology. At this juncture, I have no plans to dive into EUV scanners, as their differences from the ARF twin scan systems we've already discussed are not markedly distinct. For the technophiles among you, our discourse has been a veritable banquet of knowledge. Such in-depth comprehension of technology is the very engine of innovation, a truth exemplified by the leaps made in EUV mirror development. Sharing this wealth of information is crucial, it lays the groundwork for the next generation of tech enthusiasts who will drive forward the innovations of tomorrow. If today's insights have sparked a light of understanding, I invite you to delve deeper into our offerings. Your engagement, through likes, subscriptions, and activating notifications, supports our channel and bolsters our commitment to disseminating knowledge. Yip yip. Arf arf. Your zeal and inquisitiveness are the lifeblood of semi-slides. We have a trove of enthralling topics ahead, and I am eager to embark on the next leg of this enlightening journey with you. Until our paths cross again, keep innovating and stay semiconductive.